give you a bottle. There we go. All right, First Thessalonians chapter 3. And uh, hopefully you've got a, at least a couple of slips there on the seat to show the verses that we're going to go through this morning. We'll refer to it at the very least. And uh, so, First Thessalonians chapter 3. And we're going to read from verse 1 through to verse number 7. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1 through to verse number 7, which reads, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow labourer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you, and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labour be in vain. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, uh, we were comforted over you in all our afflictions, sorry, in all our affliction and distress by your faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace, your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that we can be gathered here today, Lord, freely, and uh, Lord, to delve into the riches of your word. I rather pray that as we do so uh, this morning, that you would just let the Holy Spirit of God lead and guide in your word, uh, for it is the sword of the Spirit. It's not the word of men, it's, it's your word, Lord, and uh, it is the sword of the Spirit. And Father, I do know that we don't uh, just wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and uh, spiritual wickedness in high places, etc., Lord, and we thank you for the blood of Christ shed on the cross for our sins. But Lord, at this time I do ask that you would cover us with the blood of the Lamb as we delve into the riches of your word, that we have an unhindered time in your word. And uh, Father, I thank you for that, for what you'll do. Lord, I do commit these things to you and ask and pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we've been going through, uh, on Sunday afternoons, we've been going through First Thessalonians. But it seems the Lord would have us to, uh, to have a bit of a, a time here this morning uh, in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians, where we're up to. And uh, we, uh, we're seeing here Paul, the Apostle, and we're going to, I'll, I'll ask you to also open, keep open 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, but open with another figure in, in your Bible into the book of Acts, Acts chapter 7. Uh, sorry, Acts chapter 17, I should say. And uh, we're going to try to flip backwards and forwards, so just keep your Bible open in both places, Acts 17 and 1 Thessalonians 3. And so Paul, here, uh, we can see he greatly desired to, to return to Thessalonica to check on them, to see how they were going. If you have a look um, up there in, uh, in verse number 17, it says, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavour the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. And verse 18, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. And so, uh, you know, when, you, when we look at uh, Acts chapter 17, verses 1 to 10 in particular, that was Paul and Silas's time there in, in uh, Thessalonica. And it was only a short time. Uh, some say only a few weeks, others say maybe a few months. But uh, nonetheless, it was a short time. But, the, but God worked great and mighty things there in Thessalonica at that time. And so uh, uh, because of the trouble that brewed, uh, Paul and Silas moved along. And, uh, and we can see the result that they really desired to, to return to Thessalonica to check on them, to see how they were going. And... Uh, we also see there in verse number 18 of chapter 2 that Satan hindered them from going back. So obviously he wanted to stop God's work from, pro from progressing there in Thessalonica, <coughs> to stop it from prospering, to stop it if, if he could altogether. And we need to be mindful for us in this day and age 
uh, the words of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in, in high places. And you know, you and I, uh, in this secular country that we live in, we tend to dismiss that side of things in our, in our walk with the Lord. But it's a very real, it's a very real battle that we're in. And, uh, and you know, uh, we do need to be mindful of that. You don't, you don't see the devil under every rock. You don't go the other extreme. But at the same time, you know, we need to, we need to be very mindful of that. We, because otherwise we become a secular child of God. It's very easy to do that. It's very easy to be in this country that we live in with, uh, with plenty, uh, in this country that we live in where uh, the knowledge of God is being educated more and more out of our kids, uh, where the, the fear of God is being educated more and more out of our kids and, and the generations that have come through as a result thereof. Uh, it, it's easy for us to not walk the kind of spiritual walk that we walk. It's very easy for us not to be aware of both sides of the equation. And so in Acts chapter 17, verse 10, we can see there that the brethren, that is, the believers there in Thessalonica, the, the new babes in Christ, they sent away Paul and Silas when the uproar that had happened there had settled. And it was only a few months later that Paul wrote this epistle to them there, uh, to the Thessalonians. And, uh, and so we see in that, again, his strong desire to return to them. And that, uh, you know, he, he tried once and again to do that. Now, so it seems with reluctance that Paul and Silas moved, to, moved on to Berea from Thessalonica when the trouble arose. And, uh, and there in Berea, they were received with an openness uh, to the Word of God. If you have a look there in Acts chapter 17, have a look at Acts chapter 17 in your Bibles, go over to uh, verse number 10, and it says, And the brethren immediately, immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews, which was what Paul always did. Uh, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind, and searched the Scriptures daily whether these things were so. And so we see there uh, that in uh, Berea there was a, an openness to receiving the Word of God. They didn't just swallow everything that was said to them. They searched the Scriptures to see whether these things were so or not. And, um, and, and as a result, there was, there was a good response to the Gospel there. Now, things went along there okay for a period there in Berea until the unbelieving Jews from Thessalonica that had caused the, the trouble when Paul and Silas were there uh, had heard that they were in Berea. So they came on down and caused trouble again and Paul and Silas moved on. Now, the thing that we know about, I mean, the Bereans and, and, the, and their manner of searching the scriptures daily is something that we're, we're, uh, every Christian is pretty familiar with. Uh, that was their hallmark. That was what they were known for. And uh, it doesn't seem that Paul had any great urgency to return to Berea after he left there. But he had a great urgency to return to Thessalonica. And he wrote, it seems, this epistle after, uh, after, after having been in Berea. So he's gone to Thessalonica, troubles brew, they've moved on to Berea. Uh, the Bereans have received the word. Uh, the, the Jews from Thessalonica, the unbelieving Jews, came down and caused another trouble. They moved on again, and then, um, and then, so Paul and, and Silas and company move on again, and and when and this when Paul wrote the, this first epistle to the believers in Thessalonica. So he doesn't mention about going back to Berea. Why? It would seem, without being stated, that because of their great desire to absorb the, absorb the Word of God, that he didn't have the same burden for the Bereans as he did for the believers in Thessalonica, the babes in Christ there in Thessalonica. Now, having, with that in mind, let's have a look there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 again. In verse number 2, we see that Paul sent Timotheus, or Timothy as we'll call him, back to Thessalonica to check on them, to see if they're going okay. 
and to be a help to them in their early walk with Christ. Now, uh, this afternoon in the evening service, we're going to look at, at what Timothy was sent back there for. That will be, that will be the points this afternoon. But, but for this morning, I want to have a deeper look at the circumstances there when the church was established in Thessalonica and the lessons that we can get for our own walk with Christ. Because let's face it, uh, if we, we delve into the riches of the Word of God and we don't get anything for, for, our, for our souls to grow by, to, to, to increase our understanding and knowledge of the Lord, to, uh, to, to help us grow in our faith, then, uh, then we're not really achieving anything, are we? And, and so let's think about this for ourselves. So Acts chapter 16, verse 9, I'm going to dig back into, his, into the history of the book there in, Acts, in the book of Acts. Acts 16, verse 9 onwards, uh, we see Paul, Silas and company have gone to Macedonia for the first time in Paul's missionary journeys. Uh, the Lord had not let them go into Asia and then also Bithynia, uh, which is, if you, if you can visualise in your mind a map of, of, uh, of that part of the world, you think of Turkey and you think of the west coast of Turkey, so that it was Asia at that time, and Bithynia was up towards the northern part of the west coast. And so uh, the Lord forbid them from going into, into those places. And, uh, and then the Lord gave Paul a vision in the night to go over to Macedonia. So off they went. They went to Philippi. And, uh, and we know that uh, Paul was uh, ill-treated there. He, was, he and uh, Silas were whipped and thrown in jail, put in the stocks. At midnight they prayed and sang praises to God. And, and the Lord answered with a great earthquake which shook the prison and flew open all the doors and and uh, end result of the, of the uh, none of the prisoners uh, escaping was that the, uh, the Philippian jailer that was overlooking them, uh, he got saved and as did his household. So the next day they, they, they're released from prison, they move on to, uh, to uh, ultimately to Thessalonica, they pass through and, uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia and they come to Thessalonica. And so in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 and 2, it shows Paul, as his manner was, went into the synagogue there for three Sabbath days, or three weeks, basically, and reasoned with the Jews out of the Scriptures about the Lord. Some of the Jews believed, a great multitude of the devout Greeks believed, meaning, talking about Greeks that had, that, sorry, that believed in the Lord God of Israel, and they were under the law, basically, and so a great multitude of them believed, and uh, that got the unbelieving Jews all in a twist. So they caused this riot and uh, an uproar, I should say, and, uh, and they, they hauled off some of the, these new believers off to to the uh, to the, the authorities. And so, uh, in the ensuing uproar, the unbelieving Jews made false accusations and, and it all got sorted out and, then, and that's when they settled, when things settled down they sent away Paul and Silas. Now I've explained that in a bit more detail to, to say that was the circumstances in which the church in Thessalonica started. Put yourself in that situation. Here, here you are, somebody's come along and they've innocently told you the word of God and you knew in your heart that what they've said was correct about the gospel and you need to be saved and you need to have the Lord Jesus as your saviour and they, and they believe with all their heart and, and then all of a sudden there's this great uproar because some people over here didn't like it and, and you haul off down to the, to the local authorities down, down the town and, and there's this big uproar and everything else what would you think as a, as a brand new born again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ how would you feel and so it was under those circumstances that the church in Thessalonica started. They'd not been well grounded in the Word of God. Paul's only been there for a short time. And uh, uh, despite their, you know, their newfound faith. And, uh, and so the Lord had Paul and Silas move along. And so we can therefore understand from our text verses why Paul was so concerned about them. Why he's saying, time and again, I would, have, I would have come back to you. But Satan hindered us. And so finally they, they, send, uh, they send Timothy to check on him. Now, uh, we can see in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, that the afflictions and the tribulations 
that the, that the church was born under had continued. If you have a look there in, in chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, it says that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. And uh, uh, for verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as, even as it came to pass, and you know. And so they were still experiencing that uh, months later. They were still having those troubles. Uh, and if, in fact, in 2 Thessalonians, the next epistle, which was written a number of months later again, uh, in chapter 1, verse 4, it shows that the tribulation and, and persecutions that they were experiencing had continued. So we see Paul rightly having a burden for these babes in Christ at Thessalonica who were in their infancy uh, as born-again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I have painted that picture for us to consider that it does not seem that they were as the Bereans were and that Paul is showing us here the need not only for the Thessalonian believers to be established through the Word of God but let me just say this to you. It is necessary for all of us. Paul is showing the great need we all have to be established in the faith. And if you have a look there in those verses, 1 Thessalonians 3, and down there in our, in our text verses, one of the reasons that he sent Timothy back was to establish them in the faith. He's, he's looking at these young Christians, these young morning and believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's going, We've got to get back there. Satan's been hindering us. He's been, he's been, he's been trying to... He's been stopping us from getting back to, to, to help these young Christians, these young believers, to help them grow in the Word of God and to, to be established in their faith. And we've got to get back there. And so in the end they send Timothy. And Timothy gets there and comes back with a good report. But the point is, for you and I... Let me say this, you and I need to be established in the Word of God for our walk of faith with Him. He might say, oh, yeah, look, I read my Bible every day and, and I've been in church for a number of years, and so. And does that mean that you really are established in, in your faith through a great knowledge of the Word of God? The Bereans, it says, searched the scriptures daily. They didn't just read it. They searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. They studied it. And what does what does Paul uh, what did Paul write to Timothy in, in 1 Timothy chapter two verse fifteen, which Second Timothy two fifteen, sorry, which is a, which is our first point this morning. He said he wrote there. He said study. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. You might say, well, why is that important? So you can stand. So that you can walk by faith. So that you'll have the, the stick ability in your walk with the Lord. So you don't faint. And, uh, and here's the reason why I compare the Bereans to the Thessal Thessalonians. The point is this, we need to be as the Bereans and consider God's Word. And consider God's Word. Uh, like I mentioned, the Bereans were uniquely noted as searching the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so or not. But we don't see that mentioned for anyone else. Like I said, it was their hallmark their distinguishing characteristic. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'll add this, it was the most important one. How much do you study the Word of God? For we are all to be, as Paul wrote there in 2 Timothy 2.15, and as our theme goes, we need to consider, as we consider God, we need to have our hearts and minds fixed on Him. The word consider doesn't just mean, oh yeah, I, yeah, I consider that, but oh, yeah, okay. No, it doesn't mean that. It means having your heart and your mind fixed on God. Where your heart and your mind fixed on God, day in, day out, affects who you are as a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. It affects 
your very, your very character. It affects what people see in you. It means that when you're out there by yourself, what God sees is what He ought to see. And not what you want to be. Consider God. Fix your heart and fix your mind on Him. That's what David's talking about there in Psalm, in Psalm 8 in our theme. When I consider. When I fix my mind and my heart on you, God. And we'll think about that a little bit more this afternoon. But, you know, we need to be fixed in our hearts and in our minds with, you know, on God's Word. We need to consider that God is more than just, uh, you know, fixing, considering God, sorry, more than just going out while it's, while it's wonderful to go out and have a look at the stars at night and, you know, get out there in abortion. There's no, no street lights, no nothing, and you stand up there and you look in awe at God's creation. While that's wonderful and while that's a good thing to do, and, and, and I've illustrated that a couple of times already, a number of times already, over the last week, it's more than that. We need to consider that in the Word of God, the Lord reveals absolutely all we need to know about Him. We need to consider that the Word of God reveals all of what He has done for us. We, need, we must consider that the Word of God reveals all of what He wants to transform us to be. We must consider the Word of God reveals all of what we need to know about what will happen going forward in this world. And let me emphasize that, all that we need to know of what's going to happen in this world. And we must consider the Word of God reveals all about what He wants us individually, and I mean individually, to be doing. Consider God's Word. Fix your mind and fix your heart on the Word of God. Because if we are a student of the Word of God from fixing our hearts and minds on it, first and most of all, from the Word revealing what we need to know about Him, it brings conviction about who He is. And I said before about the secular world and country that we live in, more so this country I'll, I'll talk about, the secular country that we live in, the generations have been educated out of the knowledge of God. And, yet, and what goes out the window, when the knowledge of God goes out the window, the fear of God goes out the window too. And, and people become their own most important thing. Well, I don't want to do that because I just don't feel good about that. Stiff biggie. Build a bridge and get over it. Fear God and realise that, you know, He is the reason why you have your very next breath. I say, how do you know that? Because it says so in the Word of God, Acts chapter 17. We, we need to consider... God. We need to consider who He is. And the Word of God will reveal that to us. And therefore, it brings about conviction about the holiness, the purity, and that you and I, sorry, the purity of God, and that you and I stand before that pure, sinless God of heaven and earth, 60 minutes of every hour, 24 hours of every day, 7 days of every week, for the rest of our lives for all of our lives. And, and all of the modern thinking in religion and the theology of today, it just, it's on the nose. Sorry. It's going in the wrong direction. It, it, it's, it's trash in the light of the creation, the creator of heaven and earth, who is clearly shown in his word. If we, if we want to get the right formula, for, 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 for to show people, just get into the book. Just get into the book. That's what it's all about. It's the Word of God. And if we're a student of the Word of God, like I said, it brings conviction in our lives. It brings conviction in our lives about what He has done for us. Fix your hearts and your minds on the Lord Jesus Christ, mutilated and suffering for you and I as He hung on the cross, as revealed in the Word of God. That speaks of his great love for us. Doesn't that give you some conviction? If you really stop and think about what he went through for you personally, it ought to. And think you think about that and then you compare that to whatever is the most important thing, all things, 
in your life today that helps give you perspective in life. Consider God's word. If we are a student of God's word, it brings conviction about what he wants to transform us to be. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it talks about that. It says, uh, and I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, changed, by the renewing or renovating of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God's got a plan for you individually. And if you don't consider God's word, if you don't fix your mind on God's word, and you don't become that student of God's word for it to, to give that conviction in your life, then you're going to miss the best that God has got for you. Surrender your life to the Lord. Get into the word of God so he can work and transform your life. In John chapter 16, verse 8, of speaking of the Holy Spirit of God, it says, And when he is in the world, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, you might say, oh, well, I don't sin. <laughs> That's pretty funny. You know, the Apostle Paul, he was the chiefest apostle. He was the chief apostle to the Gentile, but he also called himself the chiefest of sinners over in Timothy. You know, there's Romans chapter 7, he said, that which I allow not, that I do. It doesn't mean he ran around like a, like a reprobate, you know, committing all gross sins or anything. It just means that, you know, he, just, he had an old sinful nature, which he, he, he talks about in Galatians chapter 5. And we've all still got it. We've all still got it. Brethren, we need to be convicted by the Holy Spirit of God through the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, of sin and of righteousness, God's right and just ways, and of judgment. If we are a student of the Word of God, it brings conviction that what He says will happen uh, going forward really will happen. You might say, why is that important? You talk to people out there in the world today, and what's what 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 do you often get a conversation about? Oh, I don't know where this world's heading. <coughs> we do. Read the book. Get into the book. And let me just say this to you: if you're in the Word of God and you're studying the Word of God, you know that God has got all things under control. And what he said will happen in here will happen. But that doesn't mean that we should be worried. We have the hope of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You might say, well, what's hope? Hope is a certainty of expectation. There's no doubt. Zero room for, for doubt. For example... If you've come to a point in your life where you have seen yourself as a lost sinner, guilty before the holy sinless God of heaven and earth, and you know, you, you knew in your heart at that time that you needed to be saved from all of your sins and you could do nothing about it yourself and you placed your complete faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, that he has given you eternal life. I wonder how, what that word eternal means. Hmm. It might mean forever and ever, hey? In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Uh, John 10, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour this morning? Have you? Are you saved? Yes. I hope so. Some pretty quiet people in church this morning. Let me just say this, if you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Saviour, then you've missed the boat. It's not about, oh, well, the price of houses go down far enough to be able to buy a house out in the future. Yeah, I, I, know it's, I know housing's important. I know that. I, I know having a good job is important. I know being able to supply the needs of your kids is important. I understand all of that. I'm raising a family too. 
or what my wife and I are. We're raising a family too. But you know what? That's all totally and utterly in comparison to eternity, it's insignificant. It's not even of significance. Eternity is forever. It is forever. Forever and ever and ever and ever. And the biggest thing that we need to know about what's going to happen in the future is your own eternity. That's the biggest thing. Have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and only Saviour for the forgiveness of all of your sins? In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, Colossians 1.14. Have you trusted Him as your Lord and Saviour or have you not? There's the biggest part of what's going to happen in the future. If God has got a hold of your soul, if He has saved your soul, then whatever happens on this earth before you meet, before you meet your Saviour, it's okay, God's in control. He's got it. He's giving you your next breath so He can control your circumstances. If, you, if you've trusted your, your soul for the salvation of your soul to the Lord, uh, then He can take care of your physical circumstances in life. So if we are a student of the Word of God, it brings conviction that what He says will happen going forward really will happen. And then we will become secure in knowing the Lord will lead us through any times or events that come along as time goes along. And let me just add this, if the Lord tarries. Being a student of the Word of God brings conviction to be doing what He shows us individually He wants us to be doing. And I've already touched on this a little bit, so I won't go here for long. But when you study or fix your minds closely on a subject to understand the detail, and we, and we see the providence of God working in people's lives in the Word of God and doing amazing things for His glory and His honour, that same God can do things in your life the same way. But it takes for us to be a man or a woman after God's own heart and fulfill all the will of God as He leads us. Brethren, we need to be Bereans. And if it be done with the right heart, it does not produce a legalistic born-again believer. And that's what, that's what comes out. When you talk to people sometimes, oh, yeah, I, I used to go to church, and, but, you know, it's all like, yeah, that, you know, you can't do this and you can do this and you can't do that. It's not that about it. Not about that at all. <coughs> if God gets a hold of your heart, if you're into this book enough and God gets a hold of your heart, you want to be what God wants you to be. You want to do what God wants you to do. It's all about your relationship with Him. It's not all about, well, mum and dad said I can't do this and I can't do that. It's not about that. The pastor says, well, you shouldn't be doing this and you shouldn't be doing that. It's not about that. It's about, you know what? I've been delving into the riches of the Word of God and it's convicted my heart and I just want to please God. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. It naturally brings a genuine humility because you can't help but to consider God. It naturally brings a thirst for the things of God when our hearts and minds are fixed on the Lord God. Point number two, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. Wherefore let him that thinketh, that he, thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. <coughs> you know, we've been, we were looking at the church of Thessalonica. Uh, they were babes in Christ. Paul's really concerned that, that you know, that Satan's really getting in there and causing great damage and that they're going to fall and everything else. But let me say this to you. The devil's alive and well. Your old nature and my old nature is alive and well. Brethren, wherefore let him that thinketh that he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Even if you've been saved for a while, that is a number of years, it doesn't guarantee that we are established in the faith just because of the number of years. 
Oh, I've been a Christian for 20 years. Well, that's nice. But are you established in the faith? I'm not talking about whether you have eternal life or not. I'm talking about whether you, as a born-again believer, have grown in the Word of God, whether you, whether you are strong in your faith because of conviction from the Word of God in your life. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. Now remember, Paul spent about a year and a half or so uh, with the church in Corinth when it, was, when it started and, and then later on wrote to them when they're in the midst of, of many sins. And it was, it was Paul writing to the church in that condition when he said, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Perhaps he's indicating that some of the people there thought that they were okay. But we know from reading the Word of God that they weren't. Brethren, it's easy to think that we're okay in our walk with the Lord when we may not be. Proverbs 4, verse 23, Solomon, with great wisdom from God, wrote there, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So let me ask you, how much does the Word of God stimulate your conscience for the Holy Spirit to work through it? Like I said, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Why should He do that? To help you and me, I'm included in this, to help you and me stand by those things that, that are God-given convictions in respect of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. How do you go when the pressure's on in life? How do you go when something's happening, a trial or a testing or even a tribulation in your life? Do you stand? Do you stand on the faith of your Lord and Saviour? How do you react? There's an indicator for you. How do you react when something happens? Do you stand or do you fall in respect of do you let your old nature rise up or do you trust Christ to, to help you through? You know, we can, we can, let, let me say this. My wife and I, in, our, in, our, in raising family, we've tried to set a high bar. We've tried to set a high bar. Uh, are we perfect? No, of course not. None of us are. But we try to set a high bar. And you might say, oh, well, I reckon your standard's a bit too high. Mm. You know, as I go through life, I, I look. And it, when you read the Word of God, you can see it. Generations, you know, somebody, you'll have somebody up here like this. And we'll look at David, King David, he was up here like this. Solomon started well, but when he had his time to, to set his own bar, where did he go? Went, down, went, went out the window. The generations that follow you will set their own bar a little bit lower. And so if you set your bar a bit lower than where your folks have set it, guess what? Your kids are going to be doing things that you don't want them to do. When they grow up and when they set their own standards and you're going to go, oh, I don't understand why they did that. Read the book. That's what happens. Well, I think you've been a bit of a, you know, a, bit, a bit of a stickle for standards there, you know. Mm. No, I don't want my kids to get into Google or all their families if they get married. That's why I do it. And you know what? I've got a clear conscience about that. I don't, I don't, I don't, set, I don't set a standard for my kids and then go. They're not looking, so I can just let that one slip for a while. Uh -uh. I have a clear conscience because I believe in those things that I've set, that we've set in place. What affects that? Consider God. Consider His holiness. Look in your life. Think about your early zeal when you first got saved. 
when you first came to know Christ as your Lord and Saviour, and think about you know, the zeal that you had. And it was, I'm going to serve God and this is going to be the way it is. And now compare, you, you think back to that and you think about where you're at now. Is it the same? I dare say in a lot of cases it's not. If any man think, wherefore let him that thinketh that he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. You've got to keep in the book. You've got to stay in the Word of God. It's easy to get on in years in your walk of faith and go, oh, I think I'll just let that one go by the wayside now. No, no. Um, we're just going to close with something over here. Let's go over to go back to uh, 1 Thessalonians. But go back to chapter 1. But go back to chapter 1. I realise this is only talking about a short time span, but the principle applies to all of us at any time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we'll close here. In looking at verse number 5, it says, For our gospel came unto you in word, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Their testimony, and we've studied this on Sunday afternoons, their testimony was such that it made such an impression on them in a short time. It says, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. And I've already discussed that this morning, so I'm not going to go back over it, but, but, but in short, they... The, even with the affliction, it didn't stop them from believing and going on for the Lord. Verse 7, so that you were in samples, or examples, to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. That's a big area. If you look at the Bible map, you can see how big that is. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. So in other words, outside of those areas as well. In every place, your faith to God would be spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. You affect other people. Don't lower the bar. Stay in the book. Consider God's word. Fix your mind and your hearts on God's word. Do you want to be a good testimony to others around you? Do you want to see those friends that may be, may be saved, but they're mm, not, not really walking for the Lord? Do you want to have an influence on them for good? Do you want to help them, help lift them up again for the Lord? By God using your testimony? Or, or, or do you have a family member over here or a friend over here that, that's not saved, that have never come to know Christ as their saviour? Are they going to are they going to see something in you worth believing or getting right with God about? If you keep lowering the bar, are they? No, they're not. Stay in the book. Consider God's word. And the point was, if any man think that he's standing, take heed lest he fall. So brethren, let me just close with this and ask you a question. Are we individually, as, as the Bereans were, do we consider God's word? Do we let it work in our lives and in our hearts? And are we taking heed lest we fall? Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your work, for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so. We thank you that you desire for us to have a victorious Christian life. Lord, to raise good Christian families. To have a good influence, to be used of you. To see others come to know you as their Saviour and also to grow. Thank you for Paul's burden for the church at Thessalonica, but uh, Lord, as, as we can see in that epistle, uh, 
Uh, you're, you're working on the scenes, and we thank you and praise you for that. Well, I just pray that uh, you might be behind, working behind the scenes in our hearts today. May the Holy Spirit of God just work and speak to our hearts individually according as what you know we need. And Father, we just thank you for that. In Jesus' name. With all heads bowed, all eyes closed, all heads bowed, all eyes are closed. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. I want you to consider God in your life. I want you to consider where you stand before the Lord, first and foremost, in respect of your eternity. And if you are saved this morning, if you have come to a point where you've asked the Lord to be your Saviour or you've trusted Him in your heart as your Lord and Saviour, as you walk with the Lord, are you like the Bereans? Do you, do you consider God's Word? Do you fix your heart and your mind on God's Word each day? Do you study it? And are you mindful that you need to take heed lest you fall? So with heads bowed, eyes closed, let's spend some time before the Lord and consider these things. Let's pray. still praying, please continue to do so. Don't stop if you are still praying. If you are finished, we'll be upstanding. We're going to sing number 96. Number 96 in our hymn book. Sing it before. We'll just sing the first and the last. Close. In number 96, God leads us along. We'd we'll like to be upstanding. Thanks.
morning, Lord. And uh, Father, may we really consider you, consider your word. May we have our hearts and minds fixed on you as we go from here this morning. And Lord, I just do uh, ask for the Holy Spirit of God to, to lead and guide, to reprove as we know you do uh, as we go from here today. And Lord, I just thank you for these things. Lord, I ask and pray your blessing as we are dismissed this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you. Thank you.